Welcome to Worship Quest Wednesdays, a series addressing topics related to worship, spiritual formation, and theology. Today's episode is Theology of Technology and Worship. Our guests are Zach Hicks and Doug Gould. Zach Hicks has been pastoring and leading worship for over two decades in churches all across the U.S., Hawaii, California, Colorado, Florida, and most recently, Alabama. He is the author of The Worship Pastor and Worship by Faith Alone. A songwriter and producer, Zach's music is streaming everywhere. Zach's passions include the intersection of old and new in worship, the pastoral dimensions of worship leading, and recovering the gospel-centered theology of the Reformation for the sake of worship renewal. Zach has been married for over 20 years, and they have four kids. Uh, welcome, Zach. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Grateful to be here. And Doug Gould is Worship MD, a market development specialist that builds bridges between the church's worship and tech teams and the audio music tech industry. He's a veteran in the industry for nearly 30 years, serving in management roles at Shure, Tascam, and Emu Systems, and has served as a worship leader, musician, and tech at various churches throughout his career. Over the last 20 years, Doug has been a presenter at hundreds of worship conferences all over North America and beyond, focusing his experience to consult and teach others. Worship MD is supported by a number of manufacturers, including Martin Guitars, Hale Microphones, Mackie, AEA Ribbon Microphones, and many others. Doug's wife, Sherry, teaches voice, and they often travel together to teach at conferences. They have eight kids. And by the end of this year, grandkids 17 and 18 will be joining the family. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Well, during our time together today, we'll be discussing technology and how our worship is impacted and shaped by it. So since this is a discussion on theology of technology and worship, let's begin by setting a baseline for what we're talking about. So, Zach, I've heard you say that theology and doxology must always come together. Can you explain what you mean? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of only maybe modern sensibilities that have viewed worship and the kind of thinking and relating to God as two separate categories, as though they aren't kind of mutually influential and meant to be held together. And so I guess what I mean in my most fundamental terms is that if I'm ever teaching theology or talking theology or sharing about God, to do so without it being done in a worshipful manner is incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the same way, as I'm worshiping God, to do so without uh, a sense of engaging theologically is also incomplete. They, they tend to go together. I like the way Tim Keller put it when he said, um, Theology moves to doxology when knowledge about God spills from head to heart. Mm -hmm. And maybe somehow thinking thoughts about God translate into relating to God. And I actually think that relating to God is the most deepest form of doing theology. Mm -hmm. I think that's what good worship theologians, liturgical theologians tell us is that at its baseline, theology is, is relating to the God we know not thinking and holding factoids about God in our head. Uh, and so I, theology and worship are are joined at the hip, two sides of the same coin, something like that, more than two discrete categories. Yeah, that's good. Really good. Um, so how does the Bible address the question of technology? I can go first. A, a light bulb went off for me in an Old Testament survey class that I took in seminary. We had a professor that was super nerdy. He just loved to talk about archaeology as it related to the Old Testament. And he was so interested in archaeology and so frequently talked about it that every time he did, the class would kind of glaze over and stop paying attention because like, we're not talking about the Bible now. We're talking about uh, old old buildings and excavations in, in various tells in the Middle East, and I'm not interested in that. But there was one time where he was speaking, and I was lighting up because a connection was being made with regards to worship technology in particular and God when it had to do with the temple. 
And one of the insights he made, which we can go down this rabbit trail for a bit, was simply that the temple designs that God gave to Israel were not just randomly from heaven. Those designs were designs that were common, uh, even as designs of pagan houses of worship predating the temple. Mm -hmm. He was saying that archaeology shows us that prior to the temple period, there were other buildings that had dimensions and shapes and uh, architecture very similar to the kinds of designs that God gave Israel. Now, God gave Israel some uniqueness to that to show the separation from that pagan worship. But nevertheless, God seemed okay and interested in using the artifacts of culture, of creatures, um, and of his creation to be a vehicle of mediation to the people and then once you sort of think about technology as created artifacts God gives to, to mediate his, his communication, all of a sudden you're realizing, oh, God does this all over the place in the scriptures. And for me, that big aha moment came when we realized, oh, God's creation of the temple wasn't some just uh, blueprint blueprints that he floated down from heaven. He was really utilizing the way humans uh, were created to create themselves and even speaking their own technological language as he was as he was giving them this, the schematics. Yeah. yeah, and my thoughts on the temple are that even up until the present day, most of your modern concert halls, especially in Europe, have the same type of dimension. They have or they're a rectangle with the width being one third of the length. Mm -hmm. uh, one step further, when you look at the interior of Solomon's temple, it was covered with like palm trees and cherubs and things like that, like sculpture. It wasn't just decorative, because modern acousticians will tell you that those things were actually diffusers, which would actually break the sound up so it wouldn't just keep reverberating back and forth. So it's very, very interesting how yeah. design has carried on into our present generation. Except yeah. for the churches that are fan shaped, which have gotten completely away from from that right. kind of right. um, yeah. Um, Zach, I I heard you define worship technology as um, a created artifact intended intended to aid and enrich communication between God and humanity um, during gathered worship. So how do we connect our understanding of God or theology with the use of technology in our responses to God, which is our worship, right? Yeah. Well, I think this comes to reflection on how God has chosen to reveal himself to humanity in, by and large. And what we realize is that is that for the most part, God has always chosen to mediate revelation. Mm. It's rarely direct. Somehow it's through some mediated mode. You know, we think mm -hmm. of even standard things like preaching or um, or what happens in a worship service. And it's always mediated. God is speaking to us through other human creatures. God is speaking to us through words printed on a page or or words passed down from human to human in oral tradition. And it's always through a creature, through his creation, through uh, the means that he has um ordained and ordered in society and really therefore technology as created artifacts that we make um fit into that way of god meeting us mm. because uh, an art artifact that is a worship technology really is nothing more nothing less than something created to facilitate god's communication with us and our communication with god you know how we talk most fundamentally in worship theology about worship being a dialogue between us and God. Um, technology is a is a conduit through which that dialogue occurs at its best. You know, that's what it's there to do is in various ways help us in our five senses hear from God and speak to God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that definition that I kind of made up, you know, it's probably not official and People who are well, it uh, is now. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> People who are philosophers about technology might might have something to dissect that's a little bit inaccurate about what I said, but I'm just trying to come up with something that is useful on the ground so that we can begin talking about this in a meaningful way. Yeah. Um, so what does that look like practically? Like when you're talking about created artifacts as worship technology, like do you have any examples? Yeah. I mean, all the stuff that you see, a pulpit, uh, pews, organ pipes, mm -hmm. lights, haze, screens, 
hymnals, books, Bibles, uh, all those various things, you know, sound systems. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we speak of technology today in our modern parlance, uh, usually revolving around stuff that involves electronics too, but we need a broader definition if we're going to understand the link between our modern electronics that totally uh that totally have us connected and involved in worship in a certain way now with what god was up to prior to the dawn of electricity mm -hmm. there were still you know strongly um scientific mediatorial apparatuses that were utilized you know like as we were just talking as doug was just saying about the shape of buildings or even you know the precursor to the sound system which is the big shell that is behind the preacher in medieval uh medieval cathedrals and and more modern cathedrals so you've got all sorts of ways humans are bending and molding earth stuff to aid in the process of communication and sometimes that communication is not only functional it's also aesthetic so you know, we not only have all these uh, functional spaces that acoustically work well, they're also beautiful. So mm -hmm. that's why maybe you get palm trees that are both palm trees and diffusers. It's because yeah. God's always wetting the aesthetic and the functional in, in these artifacts that are utilized to capture our senses. Mm -hmm. That's good. So what would you guys say about evaluating new technologies? Um, it seems that technology is being produced faster and faster, um, sometimes even faster than we have time to reflect upon them. And, uh, you know, I have an, an iPhone 12 here, and I'm so behind the times, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so how do we evaluate new technologies that just sometimes keep coming have, at us? Sometimes you don't have time to evaluate. I remember before the pandemic, my my focus is pretty much on live sound to help volunteers who do tech and worship get a better hand on how to relate one to another, but mm -hmm. also how to use the technology that we have at hand in the best way possible with people who don't do this as a vocation. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty limited about how much streaming was being used back then. Mm -hmm. And then when the pandemic hit and the lockdown happened, that's all I got calls about. Mm -hmm. Doug, how do I make my stream better? They didn't have time to evaluate. They couldn't gather together. Mm. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to know how to stream. And they were using your iPhone 10 to do the stream with. Okay. Right, so sure. We all had to learn together how to evaluate what we want to do, who do we want to reach, what do we want to do with this technology, and how do we operate it. The thing is not to just go to the website and buy the gear. Do you have any people who know how to actually mix the stream to begin with? And you might have one guy who knows how to mix live sound, and he's the only one who knows anything about how to mix, period. So you can afford the gear. You might even have a separate room to put it all in. Who are you going to put in there? Yeah. So it's a, it's the dynamic is not just the technology itself, but how do we utilize this and how do we operate it? Right. That, that yeah. zero to 60 in two mm -hmm. days. <laughs> I agree with Doug. It's – um. When I talk about this with a lot of uh, worship leaders, I get a lot of head nods when I say what you all said, which is that the pace of technological change and the options that are before us are just way too many and are evolving way too quickly for us to properly evaluate. And there's another dimension to evaluation besides merely like what's the best thing to use. And that's totally what's getting lost in these conversations is um what would God have us use to be formed and shaped as God's people and disciples? Uh, I, I think that that's the question that we're not asking is, how is this technology forming and shaping us and in what ways? Um, and that's probably because we're still kind of catching up to the fact, as you try to teach in your book, Stephen, that um, worship is a real context of formation. And we don't realize how much not only the theological content and the words in, of the prayers in, in worship affects and shapes us as disciples, but also the, the technological surroundings, the environment is also a strongly uh, shaping tool that has effects on the way we follow Jesus. I mean, Monday through Saturday, as we're inundated with these technologies, all the social theorists will tell us we we have changed as a people group as a result of the dawn of phones. And that's not because the phones necessarily had any content in particular on them that changed us, but it's the technology itself 
and the way that's making us humans uh, differently mm-hmm. is part of the issue. And so when I think about what do we need to do to evaluate properly these technologies, I do borrow something that I think is more helpful because a lot of times people in like our worship, thoughtful worship uh, circles, we tend to be the people who are against technology or a little more suspicious. If if we're quote theologians and think biblically about technology, we tend to be almost more Luddite by disposition. <laughs> um, and, and therefore, whenever these con- concepts come up, usually the conversations are what technologies are good and what technologies are bad. And I think that's a really uh, shallow and unhelpful way of framing the question. I like the way David Taylor put it. He put it, it with regards to evaluating art in his book, Glimpses of a New Creation. He said, uh, think about it more in terms of formation. And it's better to ask of a technology, just like you'd ask of a, an artifact or a piece of art, what possibilities for a formation does this technology open up for the people of God? And what possibilities for formation does this technology close down? So this this opening up and closing down idea, like what am I going to miss if I engage this technology? What am I going to gain if I engage this technology? Which is way more useful than our screens good, is Hayes bad, you know? Mm-hmm. Our, our cathedral space is better, our warehouse is worse, you know? Those kinds of things are much more fruitful, the opening up, closing down paradigm. And we could tease out all kinds of examples, but I, I find that a super helpful evaluative grid. Yeah. 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 I think as the world gets increasingly technologically advanced, the church finds itself in an interesting position of asking the question do we embrace all of this that's going on, or do we stand firm against? Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that falls a little bit more under the good and bad question. Right. Maybe we should be asking more of that formation question. Yeah. Well, it's just like what Gutenberg did with the printing press. I mean, the printing press was new technology. What did that do for the formation of the church? Yeah. The Great Reformation happened because yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. People were able to read it in their own language. Mm-hmm. And we got away from having stained glass windows tell the story because people could actually read the story now for their for themselves. Mm, So there there's an instance of where technology, as Zach was pointing out, how does that affect our formation and our theology? Mm -hmm. Is it good to have these printed Bibles in our church? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we've touched on this, you know, right there, Doug, you mentioned uh, the printing press, but how is the integration and utilization of technology not just a modern question? Just by that example, it's not just a modern question. I mean, right. even the cathedrals in the Renaissance and everything was, the arts were dedicated to God. And now we have the church following secular culture to try to be relevant. As opposed to setting the standard and setting the bar as the Renaissance did, That's we're good. following the bar. We're right. competing with culture. You yeah. know, we're just as good as that arena concert that you just went to. And uh, so I think it goes way back, way back before that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we even touched on the temple, go back further to the tabernacle, right? And, um, Zach, you messed all of us up by mm-hmm. saying that uh, the hymnal is technology, right? Yeah. The pew is technology. Yeah, definitely. Not just the electronics. Um, so, yeah, that it goes back to, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant, right? Well, what's the what's yep. the modern hymnal? The modern hymnal is CCLI, where you have yeah. 500,000 songs to choose from where the hymnal was a collection of two to 300 songs that the church knew well. Right. Like sing mm-hmm. on a dime without looking at the page if they had exactly. to. Um, yeah. So yeah. that was an advancement. I, I love new songs, believe me. Bob Sorge once said, old songs gather us, new songs propel us. Hmm. And um, so we need the new song. Sing a new song, mm-hmm. right? But we Mm -hmm. need the old songs, too, (laughs) something Mm -hmm. that connects us back to the ancient. And um, 
So there's that that balance there. I love Shane and Shane because they're taking old hymns and making them in a more modern format. But some people are just discarding them. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think we're always asking the question, how is it that a technology helps us to accomplish the goals of what a worship service is and does? You know, um, something sunk into the DNA of a lot of North American Protestantism after the Second Great Awakening. Mm -hmm. And it was this idea that any technology is fair game as long as it helps us to reach the lost, you know, win the loss at any cost kind of mantra. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that put in our DNA a kind of uncritical analysis of just employ anything because everything can be put on the altar of reaching people for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what was sacrificed in that um, uncarefully thought about moment, if I can put it that way, what was sacrificed was a lot of the critical ref reflection and the lack of reflection on the way that these technologies indeed do shape worship and shape us. And I dare say that maybe a lot of the, quote, problems that a lot of people identify in worship today have to do with having been formed and shaped by uh, several hundreds of years of uncritical utilization of this. It's not totally to blame, but we have been we've been shaped by the technologies that we've employed without thinking carefully about the kinds of things that they've closed down for the formation of the people of God, the things that we've sacrificed as a result of not mitigating some of the losses of what this, what new technologies have brought in. But yeah, technologies uh, are age old. One of the examples I use when I teach on this, which is, it's fun to trace through the scriptures is the bronze snake in numbers uh, when the people of God were, were bitten. Yeah, it was an artifact, but it was in fact technology. It was crafted by Moses and then utilized for God to communicate to his people. So people looked at the bronze snake, and as a result of that, God healed. But of course, it was it was mediated. The bronze snake didn't actually do anything mm -hmm. other than be the mediatorial middle point between God and his people and the healing work ultimately of Jesus on the cross. Um, and I think one of the interesting warnings of the bronze snake in scripture is that sandwiched in between the instance in numbers when this bronze snake was used by God for healing. And even the moment that Jesus refers to it with Nicodemus in John three and says, Hey, that was all about me on a cross mm -hmm. is this episode. That's just a, sh a short verse in second Kings that talks about during the reign of Hezekiah, unearthing this bronze snake and destroying it. Because as the text says, the people were worshiping it. They actually gave it a name called Nehushtan, and we're worshiping it. And that's a that is um, that's exactly the point of why we can't uncritically adopt technologies is because it, things that were at one time used as a vehicle for worship become an object for worship. Mm -hmm. Things that were once mediators become the savior, and instead of uh, Jesus being the one that it leads us to, we end up worshiping and adoring it. And so the, the question I like to get to modern worship leaders is, if all our technologies were stripped away from worship, mm -hmm. what what would our worship services be? And could we worship, you know? And then we get closer to a little bit of the jugular of mm -hmm. how much we've, we've bought into the necessity of, of some of this stuff. Yeah. It's like Soul Survivor Church in England, where Mike Pilavachi was the pastor and told Matt Redman, we, we've become too concert-oriented. We're stripping away all the instruments. Right. That's all right. part of worship was written about, was they had to worship without that stuff. Can we? Yeah. Of course you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems like every generation, we have that reckoning before us, because one generation's um, fresh revival is another generation's idol, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I am a church leader, whether I'm a pastor or a worship leader, worship team member, tech team member, whatever, or even a congregation member. And I feel some of that happening within my church, either within my own heart, or I see things happening where maybe some of the technology has become an idol in worship. Um, what are some first steps that I need to take <laughs> in order to correct this? 
I think that every pastor, worship leader, evaluator, person in the seat of making decisions about these things is forced to do in that moment is make one of two choices, which is uh, either to abandon that technology, which is a real strong prophetic move and comes with its own pastoral fallout and liabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes certain situations call for that kind of prophetic swift sword. I think a lot of times too, it's not an issue of the technology being fully bad, but again, what does it close down formationally for the people of God? The other option, therefore, is to ask the question, how do I create other things or facilitate other things in worship to mitigate against what's lost by the use of that technology, you know? Yeah. Uh, the example of, of say, a context that I've been in recently where I was leading worship for five years in a large cathedral, and what that cathedral taught people almost implicitly to think about God was that he was transcendent, that he was uh, distant, that worship is a very individualized thing where we're coming before a magnificent, powerful, holy God. And all those things are true, but they're incomplete. You know, the God who flung planets into space is also the God who drew near in the incarnation. So he's not only transcendent, he's imminent. And so I began to think, well, I guess we could bulldoze this building, but I think I'd be fired on Monday if I called those bulldozers in. So maybe a better thing to do is to think how in our worship services are we actually uh, mitigating the transcendence of this space by infusing a bit of imminence? Maybe it's maybe it's the more uh, personable way we lead the liturgy or the worship service. Maybe it's in even musical style that we juxtapose a more familiar musical style in this uh, less familiar, more distant space. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's um, maybe it's simply that the sermons preached are preached in a more colloquial manner rather than kind of a high and lofty manner. And those are all uh, artistic, aesthetic, rhetorical, and musical style decisions. You know, we're we're dabbling in the realm of how aesthetics contribute to formation. So that's how I like to think of of that kind of uh, question that gets posed to us all the time. Mm. It's good stuff, Zach. Yeah, it's really good. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I, w- I was served in a church once and it wasn't quite the sole survivor situation, but mm-hmm. um, there definitely was a misunderstanding of musical worship in that in order for me to feel like worship was good this morning, mm-hmm. we needed the electric guitars and the drums and all of that. And if we had a stripped down acoustic set, that eh, was okay. You know, <laughs> yeah. but man, that wasn't great worship, you know? And so one of the ways we addressed that was we started singing acapella a little bit more in our services. Yeah. And we got to the point to where we actually would do full worship services acapella. Mm at that church and yeah. the congregation was just fine with it they sang out and it was just trying to help them see and understand worship in a different mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. and not hold on to these idols that they were creating for themselves yeah but it's such a delicate balance like that yeah mm. it's di- it's such a delicate balance and it a lot of it's very contextual you know how much trust do you have with your people to be able to do some of those more risky things like, hey, we're going to sing a song a cappella, mm-hmm. you know, in a, way, in a way you're cashing in your chips at that moment and you've got a, a few <laughs> chips at the table. And so you're always trying to gain trust in, in order to maybe cash in on those moments where you do something that's risky and prophetic and true and beautiful. But that's the the kind of dance that we do as as pastoral figures in our local churches. Right. Well, before I got saved, I played in a cover band, rock and roll band back my 20s <laughs> when you're in a cover band you better do the song exactly <laughs> right <laughs> yeah you get stuff thrown at you right yeah the mm-hmm. church is trying to be cover bands of songs sure. that have been published. Uh, i want to sound just like hill song but it's hard to do because you've got an accordion a clarinet and a stump fiddle in your band you know <laughs> yeah. you don't sound anything like hill song so when they rely on tracks to yeah. fill in all those mm-hmm. gaps of the talent that you might not possess and my my uh, suggestion is always to take ownership of a song. It doesn't have to be like the record. It doesn't have to be in the original key as Chris Tomlin sang it. Mm-hmm. Let's sing it in this key that's good for the congregation to sing in. If you only have a piano and an upright bass and maybe a drummer with a snare drum, use that and make it your own. Yeah. 
it's going to go way further in appealing to people in a sense of worship, in my opinion, than trying to be like something else that you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. So let me ask this question. Is technology morally neutral? Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of have a yes and no gut about it because technology can't be known apart from our use of it. And once we very morally unneutral people <laughs> employ it, it's it's going to have gray. You know, it's going to it's going to be utilized in ways that that form us negatively and in ways that open up possibilities for us. So um given that even our technology is formed and shaped by us even before it forms and shapes us so it's kind of an interesting irony we make the technology that makes us you know um unpack that for a sec yeah so i mean for there to be a microphone that i'm speaking into some human came up with a design someone excavated certain metals from the ground and smelted them or melted them together and and put plastics and metals and shape them into engineered factories that gave molds. And now I have this thing. And those were all um, those were all resources of the earth that humans took and and made into something beautiful and functional and a means of me being able across the United States to now be able to communicate with you as a result of the work of a human's hands. And now that we have microphones that are utilized, um, how does it shape me to not only, re I, I'm relating not only to human beings that I, I can see and touch in my local physical ground, but now I have these uh, more ethereal experiences with human beings where I'm seeing a two-dimensional reflection of your body, you know, and there's all kinds of shaping effects that that has uh, on you or uh, you know we could speak more functionally what did the hymnal do to worship well one of the negative things that it it really did was um it kind of forced our bodies a little inward and it forced us to have to hold a book it, it forced us to look down and what did that make worship often well it seems like it made worship more reverential more uh, introspective and and more quiet in a way not in all circumstances but at least in the churches i've served where hymnal worship has been a thing you find worship much more of an inward activity and then uh when the dawn of screens came it opened people's bodies back up and you found that in some context that created the opportunity uh for more expressive worship and how do the scriptures urge us to worship with all of our body with all of our mind soul and strength right so all these things that we create we create books and we create screens end up creating us and shaping worship and then funny enough we'll try to develop theologies around why we do what we do and say like oh this kind of cerebralized internalized worship is better because worship is supposed to be from the heart and then down the road we have this reflection like no as i read the scripture it's also supposed to be from the body too not just the heart and um and then we had these possibilities opened back up for us when we do have a screen situation so it's a it's an evolution and a journey and our use of them because we're sinners and our creation of them is never morally neutral like we're always tainting mm -hmm. tainting something with uh the very kind of depravity that goes into the process we can't escape it yeah so what you're saying is adam and eve messed up technology for us too huh <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I messed up technology in Adam and Eve, you know. That's right. Certainly, certainly. There you go. Um, what are some of the pitfalls of the past that we should be avoiding? So what lessons can we learn from church history about the incorporation of technology and the use of technology? I certainly would go back to understanding the second great awakening. The second great awakening really was a time where we just said, we're going to use whatever mechanisms of the day help communicate the gospel. Mm -hmm. And those mechanisms in a sense are neutral because communicating the gospel is what's most important. So I just, 
I'll communicate it through this medium and that medium, whatever. It doesn't matter what kind of space. And we forfeited in that moment the knowledge that these technologies shape us. So I think that's a huge lesson from history is that um, a strong theology of evangelism where we say, I, I, I'm willing to kind of win the loss at any cost, or in the words of Paul, become all things to all people, that there can aid and abet a certain philosophy of technology that's uncritical and therefore Trojan horses idolatry straight into our church, sure. you know? Um, I think that's a really important lesson to learn from our past, our, our recent past. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, just in more recent times, you know, many churches are are black boxes with lights low and lights mm -hmm. just totally focused on the uh, on the stage, and uh, the levels are exceeding ninety five, one hundred dB. And people always ask me, Doug, you're a tech. How loud should it be in the church? Because if I can't hear the person singing next to me, it's probably too loud. I mean, one of the things that inspires us is to hear a congregation singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the Gettys asked me to teach a class on how technology can increase congregational participation, the easy thing to say is just to pull down the fader. But there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> you know? You got you get a fine line between when it's a performance and it's too loud that people can't be heard, or if it's too soft and people don't want to sing if they're louder than the band. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So you've got this balance there, and so I think a lot of it has to do with the songs. We see. You were talking about the hymnal, looking down, but after a while, after singing those songs for a while, like in a Church of Christ where they sing all a cappella and there's no instruments. Yeah. They're yeah. also in the words by heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's that that yeah. emphasis too. When I get to a screen, sometimes you have new songs that are taught every week. Yeah. And I never get a chance to learn the new song, even if I wanted to know it. It's there for the first time, and I won't hear that song again probably for six months. Mm -hmm. so how do I ever learn the song and get to have my head go to my heart, to my body? Because yeah. I never hear that song again. There's too many new ones. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of dynamics in that whole regard of how to get congregations to participate. I think turn the lights up a little bit sometimes. They don't have to be off the whole time. Mm. We can see people around us singing and participating and moving and, and all that. So sometimes the, the concert-type production gets in the way of congregational worship, I think. Mm. Yeah. Some of the best worships I've ever been in have been in my house around a mm. grand piano with 30 people. I mean, was technology necessary? No. But as you get bigger gatherings, you need to have PA systems and such. Faith comes by hearing. <laughs> mm -hmm. You need to be able to hear, hear it clearly, intelligibly, articulately. And if I'm too far away in a reverberant room, I'm not going to hear it. I might as well have stayed home and listened to a podcast, right? So I'm, I'm venting here. but uh, No, you're good. Um, let's continue on that though, uh, thinking about those who plan and prepare worship each week. What would you say to them, uh, when it comes to this topic here? I mean, Doug, you just mentioned a few things that you would probably say, um, you know, maybe we need to sing some songs a little bit more frequently so we can learn them. Uh, maybe house lights can come up on occasion. Um, maybe we can sing a cappella sometimes, or, uh, but what are some of the practical and theological implications that keep us using technology and worship? What would you say to the worship planner preparer? Well, I think I there should, 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 I'll let Zach go, but I was just no, going to say, it should be a concerted effort between worship pastor, tech and pastor about mm. what the message is this week. Mm. Oh, good. Instead of just picking a song that you just heard on, on Caleb this week and really want to do it this Sunday, you know, yeah. how does that fit in with anything? It's just a personal choice or do we have a team putting these things together so that we can yeah, it's really good. get the most out of that gathering for people. So they have a real um, connection with, with God this week. Mm. Are we discipling? Like you said before, are we just going through the motions of, mm -hmm. You know, the three song set, the sermon, right. song at the end, and go home. Yeah. What, what's the point of all this? Is there a long term plan? And I'll let Zach go because he knows more about this stuff than I do. Mm -hmm. 
I think in two ways. Um, number one, uh, it's probably the case that week to week, we've got so much to do and to think about that to think about adding a layer of constant reflection on technology and responsible reflection on technology is probably impossible. <laughs> the average worship leader is just trying to make it from Sunday to Sunday and to do the things that Doug's talking about, to meld these things with the vision of the church, the preaching passage, whatever the framework of the service structure or liturgy is. Um, and it probably would feel like too much to say, I've got to be thinking about this technology thing all the time. So my first encouragement would be to carve out space for this uh, on a more regular basis, maybe annually. I, I do think that one of the things that worship leaders can do when they go on retreats or when they take their teams on retreats is offer these times for that kind of reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be that going on a retreat, you know, one of the things that you could do is is take this open up, close down paradigm and then throw some of your major technologies on the table and say, hey, let's just let's just hold this question before us and ask honestly what this does. Because funny enough, even if you don't come up with any answers like, OK, we're not going to have that kind of lighting rig anymore or whatever, at least it ups everyone's awareness and puts the antenna up and makes everyone a little bit more uh, just exposed and ready to evaluate and, um, you know, have, having some kind of uh, implicit criticism in a good way of what's going on. I, I think the other thing that's really important, and this is just straight up kind of Christian biblical admonition, is I love to encourage worship leaders and teams to be regularly praying the Psalms. And I think here's where it intersects with this, is if we're if we're regularly in the Psalms praying them and praying them to God, we're sitting close to God's heartbeat where a lot of these things will be seen and evaluated a little bit more easily and more critically because what the Psalms do is in a sense, create and form in us a theology of worship. As we pray them, we begin to become sensitive to the, the various themes and the polarities that exist that make a worship a balanced diet and all the things that go into it. And as we pray the Psalms, we we develop that biblical grid so that when we look at these technologies, we're very aware of how they interface and interact with the formation of the people of God. Because the Psalms, in a sense, form us that way, but give us the end game. This is what good worship is. This yeah. is what biblical worship is most fundamentally. And when you have that grid before you and you have the ability and willingness to evaluate technology, I do think they can meet through the power of the Holy Spirit in the middle for some organic and fruitful reflection. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Um, Doug, I know one of your areas of passion is helping worship leaders and tech teams communicate well and build healthy relationships. So talk to us for a moment about building relationships between the worship leader or pastor and the tech team at the church. Okay. Well, with any relationship, the best relationships aren't formed at work. Hmm. And sometimes when we're together, it's 10 minutes before a service and you don't have time to make friends. So you got to get out. Hmm. And I, I've always said this, I can solve more problems technically through a relational means rather than a technical mean. Let's say I have a guitar player who just shows up with his Marshall stack. And he's going to play this Sunday. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. And even a little amp can fill the house like you can't believe. Not even in the mix, just too loud. And uh, you go up and you don't have any relationship with this guy and you ask him kindly to turn it down. And he's going to think you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. He's going to turn it up. Yeah. So the first thing you have to do is get to know the people that you're working with. And I would suggest that any worship team that doesn't have their techs involved in their small group or their gatherings is making a mistake. Mm -hmm. They should be at the rehearsals. They should be at the small group gatherings, devotions, whatever it is. They're part of the band mm -hmm. and they should be there. And the more I know that person, if I know this guitar player and he comes in with a bigger amp this Sunday and I say, Timmy, can you do me a favor? You're a little loud in the house today. He's going to turn it down because we have a relationship. Me pulling it down, the fader on the mixer isn't going to do a thing. Mm -hmm. 
It's all about relationship. And I know the best sound guys in the business who are on tours with people, they're on the bus, they're buds with these guys. I teach at Camp Electric every summer for Toby Mac, the kids. And the thing I stress more than anything, more than the technical, is the relational. You can be the most talented guitar player, most talented sound man, but if you're a jerk to work with, nobody wants to work with you. Yeah. So let's, and let's disciple each other. If I'm a tech director, I'm going to disciple my kids. I'm going to teach them how to be a servant first, then wrap a cable. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it, it's all built on relationship. And the ones who feel that connection with their worship pastor and the tech that have those kind of relationships, I don't even worry about their gear because they're going to work it out. Mm. They'll, they'll use what they have to the best of their abilities. But the ones, what big churches that I've been in, some of them, they're so divided sometimes. It's so tech-centric mm. and so worship-centric, and there's never this changing into each other's camp or crossing the river to see how the other side lives. Right. So, anyway. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, I love the – that's so good, Doug. Um, I've heard people describe what you just said as building relational capital with people because that capital, it's like the sort of chips analogy – yeah. Inevitably, in a moment of tension or in a moment of difficulty and relational strain, there's cashing in chips that happen. And if you haven't, in a sense, accrued a bank of trust, you have nothing to withdraw from in those moments. And it, it creates uh, all kinds of headaches. The difficulty with even thinking that way, though, like as I think about chips and stuff like that, is you don't want to turn people into objects of manipulation. You know, it's like my whole purpose of relating to you isn't so that I can gain trust in order to cash it in when I need it. That really dehumanizes the individual. So it's tricky because I've been there before as a leader where I catch myself. I'm just trying to be nice to you so that I can get what you want, what I want out of you later. Mm -hmm. And God forbid that ever happens. That's just not that's not kindness. That's not real love. That's uh, that's you know, people that's treating that. like, like Yeah. Something. Yeah. Well, this one sorry. Song, he's, uh, I'm sorry, you go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, this sound guy had a kid on his team, and he knew the kid was from an abusive family, mm. getting beat up all the time by his dad. And uh, he came up to the sound guy, tell me he's on the team. He comes up to me and says, can I, can I talk to you for 10 minutes? And he had a black guy. And it's like 10 minutes before service starts, and he's the sound guy. He's got to get things done. And what does he do in that moment? Does he take the kid aside and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Or So here's what he did. He said, look, I'm really tied up right now, but can I take you to lunch as soon as the service is over? I want to hear your whole story. Mm -hmm. It just, it's, I can't right now. Mm -hmm. Or do you just say, forget this, and I'm a pastor right now. So there's that fine line, too. I think the approach has to be done, though, as a pastor would yeah. you know, have somebody approach him. You're not just a tech. You're not just a worship leader. You're not just a greeter in the church. If there's an opportunity to witness or to be uh, there for somebody and support to pray with, to me, that's like your first call. And um, mm. you have responsibility to the church. I get it. But this kid, is is it, he needs help. And uh, so he did that. He did what he needed to do. And after the service was over, he took him to lunch and they figured some stuff out. And mm. uh, but those moments, man, they come up more often than not. And he, the kid had at least the trust of this guy to mm, tell yeah. him something was wrong. That was and great. That goes a long way. Because some people just don't, you know, techs are, generally speaking, introverts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mm. creatives on the platform are, right. generally speaking, more extroverted. Yeah. And maybe a little bit more vocal, more approachable, more emo. But um... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to your point, one of the things that I've found over the course of talking about the worship pastor with um, worship leaders and tech teams is a point that brings people together is the revelation that both both the people on the platform and the people in the in the booths are contributing and making pastoral decisions that affect the uh, affect the discipleship of the people in the room. Right. 
And yeah, that's a real concrete example of someone on your tech team having a personal pastoral problem. There is also a pastoral dimension to decisions I make about DB levels and faders. You know, uh, we were just teasing some of those out with uh, hearing uh, other people being able to hear themselves sing. Those are ultimately pastoral decisions. And what I found is when I can get worship leaders to see how the decisions they make about song selections are pastoral decisions, and when I can help tech folks see the decisions they make about slides, backdrops, lighting, um, and audio and things like that are pastoral decisions, they're able to meet together and realize, oh, we're participating in the same thing, which is leading the people of God toward following Jesus. Um, and that tends to uh, lower the dividing wall of hostility, mm -hmm. to use a biblical phrase, between parties that can sometimes in large enough churches or even in small churches where there's just a diva mentality. There, there can be a kind of a, a war instead of a partnership. That's right. Yeah. Doug, you mentioned that you see probably the primary, um, how do I say it? The, the primary thing you're doing in working with tech is helping them to see that they're servants, right? right? That they are serving. So do you have any steps that you take them through? How do we help someone realize that they're not just here to push buttons, but they're here to serve the congregation, the worship team, whatever the case may be. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I get the question. I just wrote an article for Yamaha called Recruiting and Training Your Volunteers. Mm -hmm. And uh, tech teams are usually hard pressed to find help mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't know anything about it. Right. So I would always start by looking for the young musician who's not on the platform yet. Why? Because he's listening to music <laughs> all the time. And it's easier for me to teach somebody how to do some technical thing than it is for me to take an IT guy and teach him how to love music. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so when I say I found somebody to get on the team, then the next thing I'm going to ask him is how committed are they? Mm -hmm. I don't care what they know. I want to know if they're going to be here because we're servants and we have to serve. And mm -hmm. so I need you here this time and I need you to stay until this time. And I need you to commit to that for at least six months to mm -hmm. a year. Um, my wife has a story about taking over a choir and there was, Zach mentioned diva mentality. Well, there was three divas in this choir who thought that they didn't have to show up for rehearsal on time. And it soured the whole group. You know, it's like LeBron James is the first to practice, not the last one to practice. So they didn't think they had to practice. So show up on Sunday and sing the part. They don't have to be at the practice. So my wife made a new policy. You miss three rehearsals, you're out. They tested it and they were kicked off the team. And half the choir left with them because they thought the choir was going to be bad without them. But my wife's remaining choir turned into the most excellent choir they had with half as many voices. And these three people were begging to be on but they had to be committed to be on. And so if you have commitment first, talent is not as important to me as commitment is. Mm. And I can, I can help people. Now, the next thing after commitment is what does a servant do? We're here to serve the church and the worship team. So I want you to bring water to the platform before we do anything. Mm. I want you to have somebody up on the platform there while I'm back here in the booth getting them whatever they need, whatever they ask for, you can do that. Teach them how to wrap cables, how to set up mic stands, how to make sure people don't trip over stuff. The next thing you know, I'm taking them up and learn, teach them how to mix just with faders. No EQ, no compressors, none of that. Just if you see something on the stage, I want to hear it. We might pan it if it's in stereo or something. And it's just one step at a time. Before you know it, that kid doesn't want to be on the platform anymore. He's got his home studio and he's producing people in his basement. And it's a, it's a great thing to watch, to mentor young folks like that. And I know so many kids from Camp Electric, for instance, it's 13 to 18-year-olds. I got 13-year-old kids, first year at Camp Electric, that would mix it in their church for two years. Take a kid. He's he's all over the buttons and the and the faders and the lights. Uh, same thing with young musicians. I started playing piano when I was seven years old. I can I could play better at fifteen than some of the people I see in church. But you know, don't be afraid of using children in your teams. Uh, and so many sound guys that I know on the that do that for their living now started in church when they were thirteen, fourteen years old, mixing sound. So. That's great. 
Anything you want to say about that, Zach? <laughs> yeah. I'm a huge proponent of intergenerational worship. Yeah. So I get get kids involved. You know, we we do a family Sunday service at my church uh, once a month. Uh, but it goes beyond that. Even on other Sundays, we'll have kids, teenagers involved either on worship team up on the platform or up in the tech booth. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. I agree with you. Maybe you guys would want to help me. For years now, I've been wanting to do a retreat for techs, mm. for the theological side, for the spiritual formation side, more than for the practical application. Mm. Yeah. And like the Friday night would start with uh, a chapel with maybe candles and a guy playing acoustic guitar. Because as techs, we're always working during worship. Mm. We're not we're not worshiping. We we're too busy. We're paying attention to cues and mutes and making sure the levels are right. When do we get a chance to worship? Mm -hmm. And what is what is worship? Is it just about this, or is it all the other stuff that worship is, which we forget about sometimes? Worship has been equated with music, but it's not. So there'd be nothing to criticize that opening night, mm. unless the guy would rather see him playing a breed lover or a Martin rather than a Taylor. But other than that, it's like it's or if someone candle. forgets to light the candle. The candles weren't bright enough. And at the mm. end of the retreat, there would be a foot washing service with mm. worship leaders washing the tech's feet. It's just this. So I have a beginning and end. I need the middle stuff you can help me with. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. And yeah, if any beautiful. of you like are, it. if any of you are watching or listening to this, and you'd be interested in bringing your team, Doug's info will be in the the description yeah. of the video. You can contact him. Thanks. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> All right. Well, well, Doug, will you pray? Uh, for us yeah, as we sure. finish up here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, opportunity to be together and converse about some of the things that are going on with our church and the way of technology and how it affects us and our spiritual formation, the way that we think, the way that we do things. And I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit would just uh, come on us in a strong way, Father, and guide us through all these different challenges that we're facing right now as individuals and as a, as a church body. I thank you for Stephen. I thank you for Zach. And I thank for all those out there who are, who are maybe struggling or maybe they think they've arrived. Uh, if you've arrived, then please review what you think you've arrived at and uh, pray to the Lord that you're on the right path. And uh, Father, you're, you're, you're so good to us and you, you know all things. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And sometimes we think we're doing the right thing. And sometimes we just need a little nudge in another direction. And I just pray that you'll always be there to guide us and to strengthen us, to make our faith stronger. Help us to relate to people, and not just worry about the program. And help us make disciples, and not just learn how to push faders or play our guitars better. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah.